So what is life? Life is but what a person is thinking all day long. What do you think about all day long? What do you think about? Where does your mind go all day long? You know, sometimes when I'm in class, I dream about I'm in a tropical island sitting under a huge palm tree and having one of those wonderful little umbrella drinks and there's some soft, gentle music playing with tropical sounds on some woodwind instruments typical of that island. And, and then there's this cool breeze that comes across me and I feel it blowing across my suntan skin. And ah, uh, I do all this well, and I forget that I'm in a classroom. And of course, it would be so much easier without everyone telling me, keep teaching, keep teaching. You know, sometimes our minds just go in different places, don't they? What are you thinking all day long? This is what life is. Life is made and consistent of all of the thoughts that we can entertain within the journey of our day-to-day -day experience. What's your first thought waking up? Have you ever thought about that or taking some inventory? Because that first thought that you embrace is what's shaping the, the course of your day. Quite often that may be, oh, Lord, help me. I don't know if I'm going to make it through the day as I crawl out of bed. It may be, oh, there's all kinds of stress and pressure facing me today. There may be all kinds of problems. Oh, the weather's not so great. Whatever thoughts that may be that entertain, they set the course for that day. And they are shaping you. And they are shaping the, the life that you live each and every day. Your thoughts are just the images or impressions that are thrust upon you from this outside world. And we have to stop and say, where do we get these thoughts? Where do we get all these things? Is our mind constantly making up these thoughts or are they coming to us? What happens is we realize that many times we are secondhand thinkers. Secondhand thinkers. Do you ever think about that? That sometimes we're just getting secondhand all kinds of thought thrown at us through the media, through television, through the radio, through conversations, through peers at work or through family members, and they're casting these thoughts that we take on secondhand within the journey of our life. And it's our job to either decide, do we accept them, do we receive them, or do we set them aside harmlessly, just let them drift by? Have you ever had that sort of screen put up that you could say that'd be a filter, that when thoughts come, there's a little bit of a filter screen that you can say, wait a minute, I'm not going to entertain that thought. I'm not going to welcome that thought. Or have we just accepted every thought that's come to us in our life? Everything that's been presented, everything that we hear, that we entertain it, we dwell on it. Before you know it, we occupy it and become the place that we dwell in. And not all thoughts are positive. Not some of them may be embraced with some negative energies. And so we find that then they become the the format or that which shapes our day. And so we accept them. And why is it that we accept some negative thoughts? Well, we accept them quite often because of the fear that's generated in the world that we live in. We have fear-based thinking. And so when we hear a thought that suggests, you know, today may not be the best day. Today, you may be coming down with a cold. Oh, you don't look so good. Or, oh, what's wrong with you? You know, or, oh, this kind of idea that more and more the people want to entertain in our lives that the world is in chaos or there's a great problem that we're facing. And we suddenly begin to entertain these based on our fears. Maybe they're right. Maybe this could be true. Maybe I am sick. Maybe I'm not doing well. Maybe yeah, my hair doesn't look that great today. You know, whatever it may be in your life, you may say all of a sudden, wait a minute, that's where I am. And that fear begins to... Uh, allow us to entertain these kind of things. I'm going to tell you this. Fear is not your natural state. You are created in the divine goodness. And the natural state of your soul, that which is truly you, is one of perfect peace. Created in that perfect peace. Created in that perfect sense of love and harmony and all things working together for good. But we live in a world where there's a lot of fear that's cast and even taught to us. Fear being taught to us. You know, how many times have you encountered those parents that would say, you know, honey, as you're going out to the bus, be careful, be careful. How many parents have ever said, honey, go out and face the world and take some risks. Go out there and, you know, 
be a winner today, you know. But quite often it's like, oh, watch out, look both ways, be careful. We're, we impart and begin to teach fears. Now, we want our children to inherit our good looks. Uh, that goes without saying. But what about our fears? We don't really want them to inherit our fears, do we? Do we want our families to inherit our fears or to embrace them? Do we want our world to inherit our fears and embrace them? You see, as we get caught up in thoughts and in conversation, we echo them over and over again. And we become a society that becomes more and more concerned and more and more fear-based. Something may happen to your grandparents that they pass it down to your parents, that they pass it down to you and you pass it down to your children. Something may happen in a family environment, and so there's that constant fear that would be passed on one to another. When I was married, my uh, uh, wife uh, uh, and her family were really terrified of every kind of rainstorm. A rainstorm would come, and all of a sudden, they'd, uh, her father would come out, knock on all the bedroom doors, and say, everyone, pull your beds away from the windows. But why? Because lightning's going to strike. Lightning will strike you if you're sleeping, if your bed's too close to the window, and you're going to get hit by lightning. What? Where did this come from? Well, his, his uh, father and grandfather told stories of someone being hit by lightning once in a blue moon that happened in their home while they were sleeping. And now all of a sudden, that fear was cast on and over and over again. And so then uh, when I was first married, my wife said, it's storming. Are we going to pull the beds away from the window? No, we're not. We're stopping. We're not going to pass that fear on to anyone else. He was so terrified. He was, uh, my father-in-law was so terrified that someone would certainly take a hairdryer while going in the bathtub and electrocute themselves. So he refused to have an electric outlet put in the bathroom. And so, you know, uh, my, uh, my, my wife would have to run an extension cord from one of the bedrooms so she could blow dry her hair in the bathroom. But it was this idea that they were so fear-based because we know someone's going to electrocute them. Yes, while you're taking a bath, you want to dry your hair, of course, while you're in the tub. We realize, wait a minute, this is kind of crazy fear-based thinking, but do we not laugh at this for a moment and then we think, wait a minute, what fears have we embraced that someone else has imparted to us? What have we taken on? What have we welcomed? Maybe not even really thinking about it, but we just allowed a fear thought to come. The world is coming to an end. All things are going to fall apart. Uh, you're, you're, you're definitely going to have a flat tire today. Oh, I, I mean, on goes the kind of craziness that people want to put out there, and then we begin to live our fears. I want to say today, we are a more fear-based society than we were years ago. Years ago, did we not say to our kids, Honey, get out and play outside. Mother's cleaning the house or father's doing a project. Get outside and I'll see you when I ring the dinner bell. You can come back in. You go outside and play all day. Now it's like, oh, honey, don't even think about playing outside because we know someone's going to kidnap you. Someone's going to take you. What? Where did this come from? How did our world change? But as we entertain fears, those fears then become realities. Because we believe in them, we invest in them so much that that which we become so worried and stressed about, we think, well, good wisdom says and good common sense says, you know, you need to be afraid of everything and you need to be cautious and fearful of this and that. Before you know it, our whole life is consumed. And then what happens? We become like my father-in-law. We create inconveniences for our world that the world has to bypass and go around such as removing electrical outlets in the bathroom, and then people coming with an extension cord, which I almost think is probably worse <laughs> than it would be to just have the outlet. But you see how we embrace these fears? In our humanness, we've just entertained them, we've taught them, we've passed them on. Now in the scriptures, we have the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve living peacefully in the garden. What a beautiful story it is as it unfolds the symbolism of our life and a metaphor for our day-to-day -day living. And then all of a sudden, they've eaten of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, tempted to eat, and they partake, and suddenly they, who were previously not ashamed of being naked, suddenly now think, wait a minute, we're naked, we're naked. And all of a sudden, we're ashamed and feared. And the story unfolds in Scripture that the, God calls out to them, and they're hiding, and they're in fear, like uh, afraid, and they're trying to cover themselves. And 
they said, God, we, we're hiding because we're naked. And the scripture says, who told you you were naked? You know, who told you? Keith Richards, because he's been around there from the ancient times, we know. Keith Richards, you know, you see Keith Richards, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think he was in the garden. You, you know. We laugh about it, we joke about it, but when we really think about it, who told you? They came up with this crazy thought. They came up with this thought of fear based on their shame. They came up with this thought that said, we better hide because we've done something wrong. It came into their own thinking and they entertained it. And so sometimes we welcome a lot of fear into our lives, fear-based thinking. When really we have to think about it, every single day the sun shines, right? Every single day that's doing it, yes, there may be clouds, but the sun is still shining out there in the solar system. Every single day, the rain falls someplace on this planet and refreshes the earth. And every day, uh, we know that we generate and move closer and closer as the seasons change, that winter will turn to spring. We know that these cycles go on. And so we forget sometimes the goodness and we live in the fear. And our problem is we're called to be centered in the all good, the perfect peace perfect presence of the divine. I kind of limit it, liken it to drawing a little circle around you. You want to step into that circle and I'm in the all good. Or I talk about in my class a lot that you're in the good hands of all state. Remember those commercials and they had the beautiful hands uh, folded together like this? Well, that's what we're called to be, living and centered in the presence of God. Now, is there fear there? Today's scripture text says, God has not given you a spirit of fear or even of timidity, that you should be even timid about anything in the experience of your life. So when we are stepping into the center, stepping into this wonderful presence, when we say, I am in the good hands of the divine, I dwell in the presence, I rest there, I know that all things are working together for good for me and within my life, and I live this wonderful life then fearlessly, I know that God has not given me a spirit of fear. That comes from everyone else. That comes from the world around us. That does not come from God. So when we are constantly afraid something's going to go wrong, something's going to turn bad for us, something terrible is going to happen, we know that that's not a divine thought. It's not a God thought. It's not given to us from the divine at all. That comes from our entertaining of these thoughts that are out there in the world. They are not uh, our calling that we looked at the text last week of saying that we're to be not conformed by the world or shaped by this earthly world, but that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and allowing something transformative to happen within us, our thinking that we know, that we know, that we know we're centered in the divine presence. I think it's time we all go on a diet. Yes, it's the whatever thought diet, not whatever, but whatever, because the scripture tells us about this thought diet that we should entertain every single day of our life. So let's all go on this diet for the scripture in Philippians 4, 8 says, whatever is true, whatever is honest, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report. Think on these things. Perfect diet plan. If you want to know how to alleviate that fear, if you want to know how to alleviate that timidity that has not been given to you by the divine, you go on the whatever thought diet. And you begin to say, these are the things that I will think about today. Everything else I dismiss, I release, I will not entertain, I don't even welcome. I don't even spend a moment of my day wasted on thoughts that are not in the whatever diet. I think of what's true. I think about what's honest. I think about what's just, fair. I think about what's pure and what is lovely and what is of good report, not of gossip, but of good report. And so these things I will dwell on as we entertain this whatever thought diet. Now, your world is made of the image and likeness of whatever you most consistently believe in and give your attention to. And there are some thoughts 
that we give a lot of attention to that begin to shape and form. So we're on the whatever diet that we're choosing now to put our attention to all this goodness. Can you imagine having a whole day of just thinking goodness? You've blocked out everything else. You've shielded uh, your spirit from any kind of bombardment of negativity completely and whatsoever. You are embracing this whatever diet. And you're putting all of your attention into it. Because what happens quite often in our lives, we become imprisoned by the very prisons we create ourselves. We become imprisoned by fear, the prison of fear that we created ourselves by welcoming and entertaining this fear, this negativity, this worry, this stress. And we wonder, wait, why am I not living this liberated life? Because, well, we created this prison that we have engaged in that becomes a confining space that holds us in limitation. We're caught in then these traps that we have laid our own selves. So the key is to really look at things uh, in a way that we develop the fine art of looking at the advantage versus the disadvantage. Looking at things in such a way that we are seeing always uh, the advantage of what's unfolding versus the disadvantage. Now that shifts your whole mindset because everything that we do in our life every single day is based on our reaction to whatever we're experiencing, right? So we can choose. We have this wonderful power to choose to how we will react, how we will respond to anything that happens. You have a flat tire. Is it like this is the worst thing that could ever happen to me? I now will be stranded forever. I mean, it's, it, our minds go crazy, don't they? Or we could say, thank you, God. Maybe this was a wonderful way for me to be uh, held out of traffic, lest there be a greater accident or something harm come to me. Maybe this was for me to pause and slow down. Maybe there's a reason for this that someone will come out and help who needed to share compassion. Uh, you know, there's begin to think, what's the advantage versus the disadvantage? This is how we keep our life in this wonderful place of perfect peace throughout every storm. Where the real adversity is the adverse reaction to the experience that we take on. That we sort of embrace this adverse reaction. This is the worst thing or this is the best thing. All it, And you have the power to transform your thinking, to shape it. Scripture invites you to do this because the real problem is in your mind and in your attitudes. It's not really out in the world because you could say it's a rainy day and my attitude says it's a terrible day because it's raining or isn't it wonderful it rained today that the world is being blessed, nurtured and taken care of and refreshed. It's all in your attitude, It's all in that which you keep in mind. Now, every photographer will always want to take his camera and try to get the right angle when shooting a picture. But there's a perfect angle to shoot the photograph where the sunlight or the lighting is just right. How many of you have taken pictures where eh, the lighting isn't so great? Uh, maybe you haven't captured everything from its best side. Maybe you didn't capture, you know, the best look or the best smile or the best expressions. You weren't at the right angle to do it. So it is that we know that there is the best place to shoot everything. So we want to let ourselves be at that best place, that best place where we are um, experiencing the right angle, the right perspective, the right view. What is this right view? It's the conviction born of faith that I know I'm looking at everything I go through in life from the right angle, and I'm creating the perfect picture. I'm capturing the perfect picture picture of my day. I am shooting, shall we say, the mind's eye in the right direction to capture this perfect uh, expression. Because no matter what you see, you uh, have the opportunity to see good in an embryonic form. Good in an embryonic, in a birthing form. That's right. This is your opportunity in the spirit and presence of God. You have the opportunity to look at everything and say, what's birthing out of this? What good is happening out of this? What's unfolding for us in the midst of this? What is happening that you know can really help and shape uh, for my highest and best? I'm so excited to share with you that uh, 
our mobile ministry bus, Yvette. You did notice in the parking lot? She's gone. Where is she? She's at the garage getting a fabulous tune-up. You know, she's getting ready to go back out to service and getting ready to uh, fulfill the mission and the vision that we have for it. Um, we know that sometimes looking at this situation, we would say, wait a minute, it's sat there for the longest time and people begin to wonder, is there any good that can come out of Yvette or any good that can come out of Nazareth? It's kind of the same thing. The way we kind of look at it because we think, oh, Yvette, she wasn't a very good bus or whatever. I'm going to tell you this. The mechanic says she's a great bus. All she needed was a new battery because she sat for a while. She needed an oil change, appropriate. She needed a serpentine belt. We're going to get that. And she just needed to have some filters changed to make sure that she's ready up and running. So we look at sometimes we say, wait a minute, was this a bad thing or a good thing? Because what happened then was an opportunity for so many people to respond with compassion. I put it out on Facebook and I said, I know that the spirit of God's going to provide and make a way that we can pay for all of these expenses. Because we didn't have this in our church general budget line item to say, we've got something here to underwrite the expense of the bus. It's just been coming through donations and generosity of people. Someone called me and said, you know what? I just believe so much in what you do. I don't come to your church. I just see postings on Facebook. I know the work that you do. And I have just been burdened saying there's something I want to do and I have to do to bless the world and to bless the community around. And when I saw this, I said, wow, I want to help to see Yvette get back on those streets. I want to see, I want to do this. You gave me the wonderful opportunity to do something great. And I look back and say, wow, so Yvette sitting there in need of some repairs turned out to be someone's great blessing, someone's opportunity to share, someone's opportunity to feel good. So it's all about our outlook. Are we looking from the right angle at every experience that we're going through? Because this is so important that we begin to see that we are at the embryonic stage, every moment of our life, a birthing, something wonderful. If you will allow, please don't abort your blessing because you have the opportunity to birth, uh, to birth something incredible at every moment. But we allow fear to come in. We allow our worries, our stress. We allow the secondhand thoughts that are delivered to us to be entertained. And the problem is then we carry something through our lives that we carry as a burden. And sometimes, you know, we uh, carry all these frightening images that we've accumulated from our childhood too. Here's another thing, that we just keep embracing all these experiences that say, you know what, everything went bad for me in first grade, everything went bad for me in second grade, I'm sure in third grade everything's going to go bad, you know? And then you're like childhood and thinking, you know, okay, everything's not working out. I'm not very good or successful at this job. This job was a problem. I know my next job will be a problem. Before you know it, you begin to carry all of this mindset from one circumstance to the next. And that's a lot of baggage to carry. Isn't it time we kind of let go of some of that baggage, fear-based baggage, things that we're carrying with us from time to time? And we become then sort of hypnotized in a state of helplessness by the baggage that we carry. We carry it over and over again. Things from our childhood, things from our high school days, things from our college days, things from our early maturing days. And we carry them over and over again and we then hypnotize us into a state of helplessness. So here's what I want to say to you today. It's time to wake up the giant within you. There's a giant within me? That's right. The goodness, the greatness, the incredible, infinite possibilities of the divine are within you and you and you and each and every one of us. It's time to wake up this sleeping giant within our individual lives. To wake it up to say, I am not given a spirit of fear or timidity, but I have a spirit of power and of love. I have a spirit of might. I know that this is me. I know this is my true state. I want to wake up this giant within me. This giant that has the power to overcome all these obstacles. This giant that has the power to believe in so much. You know, here's our problem when it comes to faith. We like to be very practical in the field of reality, right? We think that's good common sense. 
So we constantly look at the physical world. And we're constantly caught up at the physical world. And we say, well, in reality, it looks this way. And then we have this wonderful opportunity. We come to church. We come to a class. We get all excited. Oh, the Spirit of God says all things are possible. How, how wonderful. But then there's reality. Oh, but the Spirit of God says it could go this. And here's our problem. We are pulled back and forth. We are trying to serve two masters. We're struggling back and forth in the struggle of our lives because we have said, which one are you? Are you in the world of reality or in the world of infinite possibilities? Are you living in the physical world with your consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis? Or have you moved and released and transformed your life to be based on the spiritual faith-based outlook of day-to-day -day living? Which is it? You can't have both. Oh, well, wait a minute. I, I looked at my checkbook and says, you know, I'm on a fixed income. And I only have so much money. Okay? That's where you're going to dwell then. Because you're in the field of reality. Or you can say, I live in the realm of infinite possibilities. And I have a firm belief in unexpected income coming my way. Blessings will unfold in un unusual and unique ways. When it came to the Wisdom Center, you know, we were establishing this Wisdom Center here, moving the library up to the third floor. And it's a time when people would have said, in reality, hmm, I don't know if this is the wisest thing to do to take on something more. This uh, month, we had two of our collaborative partners that use our facility and make a lovely donation move out. They have two of the largest suites. And I was like, okay, so that revenue won't be there. Maybe it's really important that we tighten our belt and we restrict and hold back. Or we can stop looking at the physical and say, what is it we feel that God is leading us to do? Well, we stepped out in great faith and said, let's go forward and let's do this. And $2,350 above our $2,000 estimated budget came in. In fact, someone wrote a $1,000 check anonymously. Now, when it came down to saying, in the physical world, how am I going to figure out how to pay for this? You know, am I going to go to Connie and say, could you write me a check? And Joanne to write me a check? And I'm going to think of all this because I'm thinking all the how in my own mind, right? And then you say, wait a minute. I'm not limited to what I know because infinite possibilities are available to me to unfold in all kinds of ways. So I just begin to believe. Now, would I have said, okay, an anonymous check is coming to me? I don't even know where it came from. It uh, was a money order that came to us uh, without a name attached. Uh, how beautiful to say unexpected income is there. Now, if it happens for us as a church, it happens for you. This is just a day-to-day -day example of what can happen for each and every one of us if we open up our life to this kind of thinking. Are you going to dwell in the physical world with your faith and say it's limited to just the how that I can comprehend? Or will you step out and say, I believe that all things are possible through God and that God knows infinite ways that I don't even know and infinite possibilities that I haven't even thought of that I could entertain and welcome. And so I simply rest in this wonderful place. And I birth in this embryonic stage my highest and best. I begin to birth it because I begin to believe as I step out of the world of the physical and its limitations and move into the realm of great faith. Now, you'd think this is just a no-brainer for Christians. because You've read the Bible. And how many examples are there for you? Jesus, looking to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, on the hillside. And is given a basket with simple loaves and fishes. Now, the world of reality would say, there ain't enough here to do even bother. So why don't we just dismiss and everyone go on home? Or to say, I'm going to work with what I have and believe in the power of blessing and of God's goodness to provide and work in and through. Jesus was at that embryonic state of birthing something amazing, birthing something good, of waking up the giant, shall we say, of God's infinite blessings to unfold and began to break the bread and share and bless it. And in the end, 12 baskets left. Not just that there was enough. 
wasn't that, oh, we had a few crumbs to make sure that we could get the last person fed. There was just a limited, we stretched it, we added more water to make it go further, or, or we made the crumbs smaller, or we cut the biscuits into 12 instead of four. You know, we did, we did everything we could to make it. No! God's infinite plan of blessing says there is enough and more. It's called abundance, isn't it? It's called abundance. Abundance says that there's more than enough for you. So here's where we've got to learn to wake up the giant within us to birth the good within us. And so we embrace that scripture that says, do not worry over things. Do not worry over things. But begin to give thanks. And as you let your request be known, speak it in advance with gratitude. How beautiful that passage is. Yet we want to say, wait a minute. I need to worry over things. That's my culture. I grew up with a mother and father who worried. I grew up with grandparents who worried. I live in a culture that worries. My boss worries. My friends worry. My family worry. We all worry. And we worry over what? Things. Okay? What does the scripture say? Do not worry over things. This is the beginning to wake up that giant within you. It says, you know what? Today, I refuse to worry about things. I just refuse to worry about it because I know all things are working together for good. Secondly, begin to affirm this beautiful passage of Scripture that says, I can do all things through Christ, through this Christ consciousness, this Christ awareness that strengthens me. Okay? Here's the key thing. First of all, it's the I can spirit we've got to embrace. Okay? If you're going to wake up that giant within you, you've got to say, I can. You've got to embrace this I can spirit fully. And along with it, realize that in the I can, you are strengthened with this belief. Well, I can, but oh, I'm so weak. I can, but it's not really possible. I can, and we make excuses and excuses, and we want to find ways out of the I can. But the I can is that waking the spiritual giant within us that says it will strengthen you give you ability above and beyond what you thought you already had, give you the, uh, the power of believing with great faith and great strength to affirm. So we want to get the strength that comes then from this affirmative thinking that says, I can, I can, I can, and strength then floods and fills us when we believe. Anybody who's lifting weights at the gym, when you begin to pull those weights up, if you say, I can't, I can't, I can't, well, then you know what? You can't. But it's when you start lifting, you say, I can, I can, buddy, I'm going to do it. I can. And there's a strength that comes to you in the affirmation and the confidence that you express. So it is to wake up that giant within you, begin with the affirmative that I can and the strength of God is going in and through me and flowing through me at all times. Number three, walk in the truth of this. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, not according to mine, okay? Because somehow we got to think that God's bank account is your bank account. And, you know, you've all looked at that bank account and said, mm, looked a little skimpy today, looked a little thin, so it must be that God's work and possibilities are kind of thin and skimpy because, you know, God's working on my riches. No, God's not working on your riches. God's working on God's riches. And God is the creator of all things. So we know that God will supply all our needs according to God's riches, not our riches. So we shift our whole thinking and belief as we wake up this giant within us that says, I know the supply is there. God is there to unfold the highest and best for me. Next, God has not given us a spirit of fear, our beautiful text for today, and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. When we understand this, we're now awakening to say, what is the spirit that God has given you? Well, it's a spirit of power. That's right. God has already given it to you. You just haven't acknowledged it. You haven't woken up to it. You haven't awakened to this wonderful consciousness that you have this wonderful spiritual power. It's called faith. Faith. Faith to believe. That's your power. When you believe all things are possible, all things become possible. That's your power. God gave it within you. 
when you begin to exercise that power, it begins to unfold for you. Peter gets out of the boat on the invitation uh, to walk on water with Jesus. He begins to do so in power. But then when he's, wait a minute, I can't do this. I, I, I can't be walking on water. He loses his power and begins to sink, right? What a wonderful lesson it should prove to us over and over again that you have been given the power. Don't lose the power. Don't negate the power. Don't give up on the power. The power has been given to you. Then it says it's a power of love. Wow. Love is so transformational. When we wake up the sleeping giant within us, it's all about love. Loving anyone, everyone, and all things. Loving your enemies. You know, one of the most important things you should do every single day of your life is to pray and love your enemies. Okay? So if you're a Republican, please, you need to spend time praying for your Democratic enemies that you oppose. Okay? If you are a Democrat, you need to spend your time praying for those enemies that you think are enemies that you oppose. Okay? Because I see you all on Facebook, and I know that when you're posting over and over again, uh, you know, that you're dishing this person and tearing down that person. So it's a good example for you that there's some spiritual work that we need to do. We need to do this work that says, wait a minute, why is it important that we begin our day by praying for our enemies? Because what we're doing is we're seeking the blessing and the highest good for those that we have the crazy idea are trying to oppress us. Okay? But God gave you a spirit of power. But no, you gave it up. And you said, they're going to impress, oppress me. They're going to make my life difficult. They're going to make my life suffer. That's your choice, you know, to think that way. That's your choice. Or you can create your reality. Now, by praying for your enemies, one of the greatest things you do is you release all this animosity that might be there in the very beginning. That's a barrier to all these blessings God has for you. So what we want to do is, that's why it's so important, that we have this spirit of love that's given to us, so we exercise it. And we begin to pray for those who we think are our enemies or who have opposed us who have caused conflict for our lives. We begin to see the blessing and the goodness on them. You would say, I want revenge. I want to see them suffer. I want to see them locked up. I want to see them imprisoned. I want to see them this or that. How about we want to see them blessed to their highest and best? And then whatever decisions they make are the highest and best for us all. How about we want to see their prosperity and blessing because Many times people are creating injustice in our world simply because they feel themselves uh, insecure, uh, unloved, uh, all the issues that they may be going through in their own life. So we're going to pray for their blessing. This is the spirit of love that has been given to us. And the next is self-discipline. To wake up that spiritual giant within you, you've got to have that self-discipline that says every single day, I release this negative thought. I will not take secondhand thoughts. I will not entertain the fears of my grandmother. I will not entertain the fears of those who passed on down to me. I will not take the fears of my family or friends or coworkers. I'm not going to embrace any of that whatsoever. I liberate myself from it, and I will not allow my life to be imprisoned. I have self-discipline that every day my waking thoughts, when I wake up in the morning, are it's a good day, and God's blessing is there. I have the self-discipline that says, when I look at every situation, I see the advantage versus the disadvantage. That's about waking up the giant within you. So it is here that we can find this wonderful passage of Scripture that says, Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, he, meaning God, who began a good work in you, will continue to perfect it. I love that. God already began a good work in you. Did you know that? God already began a good work in you in the creation experience. God created you in goodness, in blessing, giving you all that was needed there for you. And it began there and says, I haven't given up on you. Now, you may have given up on yourself. But it's time that we awaken to the sleeping giant within us, wake it up and say, I realize that what was started within me The Spirit of God is confident to continue working to unfold it, to manifest it, to see it. 
that God will continue to do this good work in and through my life, around me at all times, if I just wake up the sleeping giant of faith and the power of believing within me. How about it today? What do you think about? Do you realize that life is made of the thoughts you entertain? Let's all go on the whatever diet. Whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is love, whatever is pure, whatever is just. Think on these things. Amen.